Most crash tests happen at 56 kilometers per hour. CATL, the world's largest battery manufacturer, just did one at 120 kilometers per hour to see what would happen, if anything, into a solid object. Hello folks, my name is Ben Alexander. Thank you very much for tuning in. I really appreciate your time. Today we're looking at something I honestly thought I'd never get to really see in an automotive test setting. CATL, the world's biggest EV battery manufacturer, has just put their brand new uh, bedrock chassis, quote, bedrock chassis, that's what they call it, through a crash test. So extreme, it's over twice the speed of a standard industry test, which is actually 4.6 times the amount of energy. So that's actually a misrepresentation of the truth, actually. There's so much to get into here, and it's fascinating, like the cost of it, the uh, which cars are going to have it, uh, the weight, stuff like that. So let's just talk about it. 120 kilometers per hour into a pole that doesn't move, by the way. The car didn't catch fire, didn't explode, didn't kill nobody. Nothing happened, no smoke, no thermal runaway. It simply just survived, just took it like a champ. So why is this test more crazy than I thought. Happens at 56 kilometers per hour. CATL's test was more than double that speed, which was 4.6 times the amount of impact energy as a net result of that. And this wasn't into a wall where the wall, you know, the, the whole front end crumples evenly and shares that load. This was a frontal pole test which concentrates the force into a, a tiny section of the chassis. CATL actually say that the force per square centimeter was 21 times greater than a standard crash test. Usually in a test like this, the battery is the weak point. That's when you see, you know, explosions or fires or smoke, something like that. But nothing happened here. The bedrock chassis just simply absorbed it. The cabin integrity stayed intact completely. High voltage cutoff happened instantly in the, t I will get into the numbers in a second, by the way. There was no chain reaction, nothing at all. For context, we all know what the nightmare scenario would be if you crash your car with a battery underneath it. So in the EV safety world, this went really, really well because when a lithium ion battery goes into thermal runaway, after an impact, you can have a fire that burns for hours or days sometimes. It's a very serious thing. CATL's platform just proved it can actually prevent that, even at an absurd speed. How did they pull it off? So this is where the engineering gets super geeky. So the bedrock chassis uses cell-to-chassis integration, which is a term that's like a throwaway term. We use that all the time. What does it actually mean in this instance? So instead of having a battery pack that is a separate unit simply bolted to the frame, think of a Nissan Leaf, for example, the cells are actually built directly into the structure itself. CATL says it can absorb up to 85% of the collision energy compared to around 60% for a traditional setup where they bolt the battery underneath. It also makes it a lot harder to repair it as well when it cra when you crash the car, which is a whole nother topic. We will get into that in a minute briefly. It's wrapped in what they call a three-dimensional biomimetic tortoise shell structure. Basically, it's a network of rigid and flexible sections that distribute force away from the battery cells. So another way to think about this is almost, if you open your bonnet, look at the grooves and the lines underneath the bonnet, and they're actually kind of directing the way that the energy is flowing through the, the bonnet, when you crash the car, and they do that on purpose. Those lines are there to serve a purpose. It's the same sort of thing. They've just extended it further and put it around a battery, and it's a lot cleverer than those simple lines on the back of a bonnet. But that's kind of what I'm getting at. So submarine grade steel rated at 2000 MPA, aerospace grade aluminium rated at 600 MPA, plus an aircraft carrier style arresting structure that acts like a built-in crash barrier as well. On top of that, the electronics react really, 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 really fast to stop any arcing, which is obviously one of the things that would start a fire outside of the battery. High voltage is disconnected in 0.01 seconds, and residual energy is discharged in 0.2 seconds, which is very fast. CATL even put it through extra abuse. Sled tests, bending tests, they even cut into the pack with a saw, still no fire. Although I don't know if they cut it in half or just went, you know, a quarter of the way through or what they did. I'm going to dub this the God Battery because of all this combined, it's frankly godly. It's fantastic. So why does it matter for the industry? This isn't just about bragging rights in a YouTube video. Really, I don't think it is. It could change how people see EV. It could change how people see EV safety. It's one of those innovations that really does put very tangible distance between EVs 
and fires. So I think we can all agree that it's a biggie, basically. This is a really great thing. This is probably bigger than any of us can really comprehend. There's still a perception that EVs are more dangerous in crashes because of battery fires. And this kind of uh, result says otherwise. And what I like to see online whenever I see stuff on Facebook or the internet, not that I really go scrolling very often, but every now and then I see a thing about, about EVs being very bad for fires. And then I look underneath and there's always two or three people saying that, you know, it, that's rubbish basically. And that EVs are actually 20 times less likely to be involved in a fire full stop basically we could go we could layer that down but i'm not going to get into that so the bedrock chassis is also a skateboard platform that's what they say meaning it's designed to be a base for all sorts of evs from sedans to suvs and it cuts vehicle development time from 36 months to 12 to 18 months roughly when a manufacturer decides that decides that they want to use this platform it's just a matter of deciding where to run the wires essentially uh, from the platform underneath the car to the body itself and how to mount it and integrate everything. So Avata is the first brand to use it. It's a high-end Chinese manufacturer backed by CATL, Chang'an, Huawei. This means that we could actually see this, this in production in, uh, in, in production vehicles quite soon. This architecture gives automakers more flexibility, faster time to get the product to market which is obviously, it's kind of like a plug and play sort of product, I guess, for a manufacturer. And the ability to integrate CATL's latest battery tech without redesigning the whole car. So CATL just raised the bar, not just for EV batteries, but for the chassis design in general. This wasn't a marketing stunt. This was uh, the most extreme real world crash scenario you could probably throw a modern EV platform into. And it survived it without a single sale going into thermal runaway, which is just an incredibly big thing in 2025. That's really what we need to be seeing in the next year or two or three by different manufacturers, not just CATL. If this tech rolls out into mass market EVs, it's going to make the, the EV fire debate a lot less relevant. Although even once they don't exist, I really do think that we will still be seeing people chirping away like magpies in the background somewhere saying, oh, you know, electric cars are always on fire everywhere. Terrible. And, you know, nobody really mentions as well, like one of the, the main causes of vehicle fires, if it's not an electric car, if it's got a petrol engine, for example, is grass. I think grass has an ignition temperature of something like 270 degrees Celsius and uh, when it's dry, obviously, and then that can ignite. But of course, what is underneath a lot of cars, for example, a Honda Jazz back in the day, a catalytic converter and it's the catalytic converter that's touching the grass setting cars alight all over the place so it's things like that really nobody talks about that because there's no money to be made in that so evs are literally the hot topic aren't they so there are some fascinating things to mention here about the weight about the cost because the geekiness does not stop here we can take this further cell to chassis integration reduces the need for a separate heavy battery casing so that obviously cuts 30 to 50 kilograms versus a traditional pack, according to CATL. Submarine grade steel is very heavy, but the use of aerospace aluminium offsets most of that. I think it's 85% is what they told me. The, the important part is the net result. So the bedrock chassis ends up uh, with around plus 20 kilograms of a standard EV platform, despite the massive strength gains, despite some of the parts being heavier because some of the other ones are offsetting that basically that's what we're doing not that i really advocate offsetting because you know then i'd be kind of fine to say i run a diesel generator to heat the house but i'd have solar panels to cook on for example and i don't really condone that it's just a bit offsetting is a bit of a it's a weak thing to do i think i think we could do better than offsetting this day and age on a per vehicle basis analysts estimate four to eight hundred us dollars extra manufacturing cost for them not us compared to a basic skateboard chassis so what that translates to to us i don't know if we'll pay much more if insurers view this as significantly reducing fire risk premiums for evs with this chassis should in theory drop i'm not sure we are actually going to notice anything and uh, that's an indirect cost saving for the owner though if we do see a drop in price there. Structural battery packs like this are harder to repair after a severe crash. This is a big one, this one. You can't just swap a module, obviously. You can't just drop it out and change some cells. It's really, really hard. 
And uh, this means it's way more likely to be that your car gets written off after a crash. Insurers like to do this anyway in 2025. They're just writing electric cars off constantly and they're gonna do it even more when this is the case. But I'm curious, do you think modern cars at the minute, electric cars I'm talking about, are safe enough already? Please consider just letting me know in the comments. A lot load of other people read the comments, it's not just me. I read as many as I can, I reply to uh, pretty much all of them, I think. Uh, I do think they are safe enough to a degree, I, you know, to allay a concern from a prospective buyer, but you can never truly have safe enough. So it's a pretty tricky one, isn't it? You can't really say they are safe enough at any point, I suppose. Thank you for watching. Thank you also to the Patreon members, the YouTube members, and all the people that gave me a super chat recently, which I didn't realise until yesterday, actually. So I'm, I'm sorry for that. And yeah, really, thank you very much. I'm very touched that you like my work enough to, to chip me a couple of dollars as a thank you. And some of you even just said thank you, which I thought was really nice. Thank you. Uh, so if you want to see more videos, you're welcome to subscribe. Although... If you are subscribed, it's often now that you won't get shown my videos from YouTube, so you have to click on it, on the actual subscribe button, the little triangle thing next to it, and click show all, as opposed to personalised. That way you will actually get to see my work, which is what I think actually people want when they click subscribe. They want to see my videos.